Sundar, thank you for doing this. Well, and it's thank a pleasure. You for, thank you for showing me around. I've never been in one of those. Not a lot of people get in this data center, do they, who don't work here? Well, we are pretty careful about it, but you know, it was a pleasure to show it to you. Thank you very much. So let's start really big picture. What is Google today? Are you a search company? Are you an ad company? Are you an AI company? You know, at a core level, uh, we want to be helpful to users in moments big and small through the course of their day. And be it giving you driving directions or be it uh, helping show your photos back when you need it. And we want to do it for billions of users at moments that matter. But you've, you've said, you said at Google I.O. recently, we're moving from a company that helps you find answers to a company that helps you get things done. Mm -hmm. That left me wanting to know, is the company fundamentally changing? Because of AI? Because of AI, we can do more, and our users demand more. You know, in the past, they may be okay with just getting an answer, but maybe now, today, if they want to go to a restaurant, they actually want that reservation done. So we are constantly pushing to see how we can save them a little bit more time, give them peace of mind. One of the things that you've talked a lot about is, in your words, the immense responsibility mm -hmm. that you think Google has to make the world a better place. And I wonder, in this moment, as we sit here, what do you think the number one thing is that Google needs to do to actually achieve that and to fulfill what you call this immense responsibility? I mean, a few things. Um, you know, we are one of the leading companies in AI, so we're committed to driving AI development responsibly in a way that benefits society. Uh, that's a big sense of responsibility we feel. Uh, we feel that on the content on our platforms, uh, you know, one of the things we've all grappled with over the past few years is to making sure that the content we have on our platforms is safe mm -hmm. and, and, and benefits people. And so that's something we feel a sense of responsibility. Protecting user data, uh, the scale at which uh, we operate. We want to keep our user data private, secure, and give them the choice and comfort they need around it. What is the Google moonshot that you think right now has the biggest shot at changing humanity? Maybe we're working on something called quantum computing, and uh, it is effectively the next stage of computing we, are, we, we all think of as a moonshot, uh, which will help not just artificial intelligence, but solve many new problems in the world. So it's an example of the kind of moonshot we get excited about. Did you want to be CEO of Google? Like, really, did you want the job? Did you lobby for the job? Because I remember when you were picked, and many people were surprised many Googlers were happily surprised who had worked with you but you didn't you don't strike me as someone who raised their hand and lobbied for the for the top job I mean I really it's an opportunity of a lifetime I I, I just wanted to build products so for me I get my satisfaction from bringing day-to-day -day products which millions of people use and it's what I was doing and through the course of that uh, you know uh, one day when Larry and Sergey asked me to do this, uh, you know, I felt it was a privilege, but that's how it came about. Were you about. surprised? Uh, yes, a little bit. Uh, you know, I was busy building products, and I quite didn't uh, anticipate where this would go. But and you'd never asked for it? No. Well, a lot of people do, you know. So let's talk about you before Google and who you are fundamentally and how, how you got here. You grew up in Chennai, India. What was life like growing up as a child? Oh, you know, there was a simplicity to it. Uh, you know, uh, I greatly enjoyed it. In some ways, when I was growing up, there were no computers, uh, no television, no internet. And so it was mainly friends and playing sports and reading books. And, and so, uh, you know, that simplicity is still there with me today. Uh, we grew up modestly, um, but through discrete moments, we got access to something new in our life. So we waited for a telephone for about five years, and we had to apply and wait for it. Uh, before that, there was only one street in the, uh, you know, in the entire street, there was one other home which had a telephone. So sometimes we would go there to make a call. And for me, once we got the telephone, others would come to our house. It was kind of an open door thing. It became a communal thing. People would come to call their kids. And so for me, it showed the power of what's possible uh, with technology. Do you remember the first time you touched a computer? You know, when I was in uh, college and, you know, I had to... At Stanford is the first time you touched a computer? It, in India, when I went to college, I had access to it a very few times. Okay. But when I came to Stanford, there was a time I could actually, you know, had kind of a dedicated computer. And so, uh, you know, it was a big moment in my life. 
there was a drought in India when you were growing up, and it, it, that experience still affects you today. You know, growing up in Chennai, uh, there was uh, severe water scarcity going up, and so they would uh, literally truck water in, and we would collect uh, you know, a few couple of gallons of water per day, and we would stand in lines, get water. There was no running water, and that's mm -hmm. how you know, we used it. But, uh, you know, but it, I still had a very positive life, and you know, I grew up in a culture where people valued learning, and, and there was a sense of community around it. So I felt like I had everything I needed. Coming here to the United States to, to go to Stanford, first time you were on a plane, and you talk about the pretty significant culture shock for you coming to this country? It was, you know, I landed in Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, that's where my uncle and aunt live. Uh, and to come and see, you know, everything was different. Um, you know, we used to have dinners at about 10 p.m. in the night in India. And so it was the first thing I noticed, people had dinners earlier. Um, watching baseball was quite interesting. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd grown up playing cricket, which is kind of similar to baseball. Both have a ball and a bat, but everything is different. Uh, in, in cricket, you run with the bat whenever you run. So, you know, all these small things, and it took me a while to get my hands around it. Did you run with the bat when you were playing yeah. baseball? I not only ran, in cricket, it's a good shot to hit behind you. So the first time I hit the shot behind me, I thought I had a great shot, and everyone was looking at me, no, that's not what you do in baseball. I don't know if people will believe this, but tell me if it's true. You told uh, The Guardian, I didn't understand the internet. The change was too much for me, and I was a little bit lost. The CEO of Google didn't get the internet? I literally had come to the U.S. in 1993, and I was uh, you know, absorbed in com you know, using computers. Uh, it's not that I didn't understand the internet, I just didn't realize the magnitude of what was happening around me. It was literally the beginning of internet as we know it today, and the scale of it, uh, you know, I hadn't fully internalized it. I'm interested in the, the impact specifically that your mother had on you, because you've talked about how how smart she was, but that she was really limited in her ability to grow because of limited financial means, that that really stifled her educational opportunity. And I'm just interested in how that changed you. Well, you know, my mother uh, is who instilled in me a deep sense for knowledge, reading, curiosity. I picked up my reading habits from her. She dropped out of high school to support her family. And, uh, you know, being a girl at that time, I think she literally quit school to support uh, the education of boys around her. And so, you know, it was a different time, but for me, I always internalized the sacrifice she made, but in me, she instilled why, you know, you want to pursue education. So you have lived this true American dream, and you've talked about how it's like the remarkable thing about America that this could happen to you. Do you feel as though your American dream is as alive today for young immigrants to this country as it was for you? You know, I still think America is a land of opportunity and, you know, I see countless stories of people, uh, you know, who, who have, you know, had opportunity and made the most of it. And I, I still think that's true today, but I think we need to work hard to make sure it is true. Uh, if you look at the technology industry, if you look at all the uh, leading companies, many of them were founded by immigrants. Our leadership in technology comes from our ability to attract the best computer scientists, AI researchers, and you know I think it's important that we continue to do that. You have said that you have called members of Congress from both parties mm -hmm. to talk to them about immigration. Who have you called most recently, and what did you ask for? I mean, throughout my visits, uh, engaging across both sides, uh, when I get a chance, I both uh, make the case for be it high-skilled immigration to make sure as a country we can continue the progress in technology we see. I've even advocated for, you know, dreamers. There are people at Google whom I've met or whom I've heard from who, you know, have a computer science degree, work at Google, but they found out when they were 16, you know, that they are a dreamer effectively. And, you know, I think there is a bipartisan will and desire, I think, to do more here, but we just need to capture the moment, make the most of it, and I think we can do more. Who have you been speaking to who's been helpful on this front? You know, across the board. Uh, Republicans, Democrats? Democrats, through the course of my visits, yes. There's a big debate in this country now, as you know, uh, about capitalism mm -hmm. and socialism. And I wonder, um, as a product of what American capitalism can do, Google and you personally, 
Is capitalism working for enough Americans right now? You know, capitalism is still the best system we know that works, uh, works well in terms of growing an economy. But I do think we need to make sure that the pie works better for everyone. And if you look at uh, where the real issues have been, if you compare to where the wages have risen versus the cost of basic needs like healthcare and education, clearly you know, that gap is not quite sustainable. And so I think you, know, you have to take a look at it and see what more we can do, public, private sector, together to you know, address those needs better. Because when you look at the, the growing income gap, and when you look at Silicon Valley and the cost of housing, mm -hmm. and you look at San Francisco and the homelessness, what I would call a crisis there, mm -hmm. I've seen it. Do you think the vast inequality in and around Silicon Valley is harmful to society? I, if you look back at the roots of Silicon Valley, what made the place great is its ability to attract a diverse group of people, right. different professions, artists, teachers. And for sure, we are losing, losing an aspect of that. And uh, you know, so I think it's important we try and figure out sustainable housing. Uh, we, you know, even thinking through transportation and making it better so that if people are living a bit far away that they can get to where they need to work. Mm -hmm. These are all the things we have to do as a next generation. Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff calls it unregulated, unbridled capitalism and capitalism run amok. And I wonder if you agree with him and if you do, what you think sort of the, the best solution is at this point. You know, I've always felt that, uh, you know, running a company at this scale, yeah. uh, I think, and I think Mark believes that too, you know, you need to have a sense of responsibility to society and you need to do your part. Uh, we as Google are very committed to doing so. We do it through uh, various initiatives. But I think entire private sector needs to do that and you know, government needs to do more too to manage this phase of uh, growth, growth we see, which is disruptive. I'd like to ask you about the Justice Department, uh, news out of the Justice Department. There's reporting that the DOJ is, is laying the foundation for a possible antitrust investigation into Google. What's your reaction to that? You know, we've always felt as a large company, we've gone through uh, similar uh, you know, scrutiny in other countries, including in the US before. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I think it's perfectly fine that uh, you know, as companies get, get to a big scale, there is scrutiny. Uh, scale does offer many benefits. It's important to understand that. As a company, we now invest sometimes thinking five, 10 years ahead without necessarily worrying about short-term profits. Uh, and you know, and if you if you think about how technology leadership directly contributes to uh, leadership in in a global economic scale, you know, big companies are what who are investing in technologies like AI the most and quantum, as I said earlier. So there are many benefits taking a long-term view, you know, driving long-term development, which big companies can do. But I think it's important to make sure that we are also able to create a healthy, competitive ecosystem in which other companies are able to emerge. And, you know, and that's the important question. You know, and I think scrutiny is right, and you know, we will participate constructively in these discussions. Did you, did you expect it to come, Sundar, or were you surprised by this news? It, it, not, I mean, maybe the specific, uh, specific timing of it, but you know, we had always expected. Uh, you know, we've gone through uh, similar situations in Europe, and so it's not a surprise to us. Congress, the House Judiciary Committee, has also launched this top-to-bottom antitrust investigation into you and your competitors, the whole tech mm -hmm. industry, all of big tech. And I'm interested if that has changed any action you take within Google, meaning has it changed what you and the board are talking about? Has it made you rethink potential acquisitions for anything that may look anti-competitive? You know, for Google, the scrutiny has been there for a while now, so we've always taken that into account. Uh, there have been times when we've looked at some acquisitions and said, look, this is not uh, you know, something that may be possible. And so we've always taken that into consideration. Because of this concern. Yeah, pot yeah potentially you know, making sure you know, there's not too much concentration in a sector or so on. So, uh, but I think for some of the other companies, maybe the scrutiny is newer. But for us, you know, we've had this for You're a while. We're used to it. Yeah. So as you may have heard, some 2020 contenders and lawmakers think you guys and all your competitors are way too big. Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren, a Democratic 2020 contender, has even put a billboard in San Francisco talking about breaking up big tech. And she says that Google and its competitors are, in her words, they have too much power. She says, you hurt small business and stifle innovation. Is she right? I mean, you have to look at the actual facts and, you know, 
we, first of all, as a company, we do many things. Um, some areas, we are upstarts. We are challenging other established uh, companies. And so, you know, if you look across the breadth of what we do, uh, I think, you, you know, you look at every area, you know, and you, you look at whether uh, there's other competition and whether users have choices. And above all, are we doing well because we are executing well as a company or, you know, and doing the right things and doing well or not? And so, you know, the details end up mattering. And, you know, so I also think it's important that when we look at it globally, our tech companies are going to contribute to our economic growth in an important way. And we compete against other countries, other companies. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind as well. It sounds like you think she's wrong. You know, I, I, I think there needs to be a healthy debate. Right. Uh, you know, any campaign has, uh, you, know, uh, you know, moments around that. But what matters to me is the healthy, thoughtful conversations around it. Your argument about other countries and America's competitiveness is similar to an argument Mark Zuckerberg has made. Basically, we're going to do it or China's going to do it. Is that essentially what you're saying? Don't, don't stifle this growth in America or it will go elsewhere? You know, it, it could, you know, when being in Silicon Valley, for example, I always think, I mean, you can't take for granted uh, that you will always be successful. I think you have to earn it. Uh, you know, now there are many countries around the world which aspire to be the next Silicon Valley and they are supporting their companies too. So we have to balance both. This doesn't mean you don't scrutinize large companies, right. but you have to balance it with the fact that you want you want big, successful companies as well. Well, to that point, I mean, I know that you view Google as more than an American company. You mm -hmm. view it as a global company. So are you essentially saying, look, look at us. You've even asked for regulation for rules of the road. But if we are too squeezed or broken apart, we won't hesitate to build more elsewhere. It, you know, it's, it, it basically, I worry that if you regulate for the sake of regulating it, it has a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, you know, if you take a technology like artificial intelligence, you know, you know, it will have implications for our national security and, you know, and how or for, you know, other important areas of society. And so having leadership, I think, ends up being really critical. I'd like to spend some time talking about what I know has been on your mind a lot mm -hmm. uh, lately, and that is YouTube and the situation with YouTube. How do you see YouTube's role in society today? To us, um, YouTube has been a phenomenal platform uh, which uh, gives many people voices. It's a chance for them to reach the world. Uh, it's an extraordinary entertainment platform. It is more than people realize, one of the largest educational platforms in the world. Literally, people learn all kinds of things on YouTube, be it how to play music, how to learn a new language, cook a recipe. We see millions of uh, that happening. Many small businesses use YouTube to literally export their products, you know, make people aware of it. Uh, you know, just yesterday, you know, I ran into the CEO of a company called Strider. They're based in South Dakota. They make kids' bikes, pedal-less bikes with which you can learn. Uh, you know, t in 10 years, they've sold two and a half million bikes in 78 countries. 50% of it is exported outside the U.S. YouTube played a big role in people understanding what the company is about and reaching the world. So we see all of that happening through YouTube. Let's talk about the spread of disinformation and hate on YouTube as well, because that has also um, risen to the surface. So from anti-Semitism to harassment of LGBTQ individuals, conspiracy theory videos about the Parkland shooting or, or Sandy Hook. I mean, fundamentally, Sundar, where, where do you draw the line with YouTube between hate and free speech? You know, it's a, it's a line we, you know, we work hard to get right. And, you know, and, and every few years, we feel the need to evolve them because we see changes in how the platform is getting used. Just last week, we had significant revisions to our uh, hate speech policy. At YouTube, we are very focused on removing harmful content and reducing the spread of what we think of as borderline content. Just last quarter, we removed over 9 million videos. And, and so it's an ongoing process. But there's more we need to do, and we acknowledge that. Because in America, right, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Mm -hmm. And YouTube has really become our theater. It is. It is uh, the equivalent of, uh, you know, in the real world, people getting together and talking. That can happen in YouTube as well. 
but it also allows us an opportunity to enforce rules of the road in a way yeah, we haven't been able to before as well. So we can use the forces underlying in YouTube and, and take them in a positive direction as well, which we are committed to doing. I ask um, because, and you did lay out many new ground rules for YouTube just about a week ago, but even a week after doing that, CNN still found that there were white supremacists, white nationalists, videos up from uh, Richard Spencer and KKK leader David Duke. You've hired thousands of individuals to handle this. And I just wonder if, Sundar, you, you believe that the predicament is so big that this is evidence that there will never be enough humans to take all of these videos down. It is a challenging problem. Uh, even when we announced new policies last week, it will take us some time to go back through our corpus and actually enforce it, so there's, there's a time gap there. But we've gotten much better at using a combination of machines and, uh, and humans. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are many areas where we have made significant progress. So it's one of those things in which, let's say we are getting it right over 99% of the time, you'll still be able to find examples. Our number is, you know, our goal is to take that to a very, very small percentage, well below 1%, which is what we are working but it, on. But it sounds like you're, you're saying it'll never be 100%. I think any large scale systems, uh, you know, it's tough. You know, think about credit card transactions. There is some fraud in the system. So anything when you run at that scale, you know, you, you know we, we have to think about percentages. Today in search, we aim to be 99.99 percentages right. And I hear you on credit card fraud, and I, I understand that, but for example, violence can erupt from this, right? There was that 2016 incident where someone watched a Pizzagate conspiracy theory video on YouTube and then went and, and fired shots inside a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. Um, so it, it's just the fundamental question of how, like, can AI solve this? Can tech solve this? Uh, you know, I, I am confident we can make significant progress. You know, we've all really been working on this now for, for the past few years. Mm -hmm and AI is getting much, much better. There are some things which are going to be hard because they're actually societal definitions of what's okay, what's acceptable and not, and that's not a technology issue alone. But I do think on areas where we can agree on, enforcement will get better uh, with the help of technology. So when YouTube announced these new rules that it would take down these videos, that included taking down all of those horrible conspiracy theory videos denying the Sandy Hook massacre, but an attorney representing 10 of the families who have family members who were killed in that said that it's, it's too late to undo the harm and talked about the undue harassment and threats that they had sustained. I just wonder why it took seven years to realize that those videos shouldn't be up and, and ads shouldn't be running next to those videos. You know, I mean, it's heartbreaking for sure. And, you know, all of us, uh, you know, would look back and, you know, we, we wish we had gotten to the problems uh, sooner than we did. And, you know, there's an acknowledgement we didn't get it right. And, but I think we became aware collectively of some of the pitfalls here. And, uh, you know, since then we've been working hard. We have changed our priorities. Uh, and, and, you know, we have put in a lot of effort there and will continue to do that. You said something a few years ago when I was reading some old interviews of yours that really struck me about this moment. Mm -hmm. And you said, Sundar, I think tech has to realize it just can't build it mm -hmm. and then fix it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's the predicament you guys are in now because, because you did build it and now this is a huge fix that you're grappling with? It's something we are very conscious of. Uh, this is why when we are approaching our work in AI, we have tried to thoughtfully lay out a set of principles against which we will constantly evaluate the work we are doing. And we'll talk about that in a moment and what, you, what you're not willing to do because of ethics. Yeah, you know, and so it's an, it's an area where we are being careful precisely because of, you know, just doing uh, fast development can lead to uh, consequences that you don't foresee. You're saying don't move fast and break things. Yeah, I, I want to make sure we move deliberately uh, with a sense of our responsibility to society as we develop powerful new products. So one more question on YouTube before we move on, and that is on, on recommendations. Mm -hmm. And I ask this as a journalist, but also as, as, as a parent, right? Because my, my three-year-old uses YouTube, and there has been, as you know, some great concern over the recommendation algorithm mm -hmm. that has been pushing some videos of children toward pedophiles. and 
the question about the algorithm, and I'm interested in if, I know you're working on it, but are you at this point considering ending the recommendations until you can get that algorithm right so it doesn't keep happening? I mean, recommendations offer us a great opportunity to actually direct content towards higher quality content. We have done this in cases, for example, uh, you know, in terrorism recruitment videos, being able to counter offer suggestions and get people to a better place. You know, uh, we see that applying in a wide variety of cases. So one of our biggest focuses is to understand quality of videos and, and use recommendations as a way to get people to more valuable videos. So you think it would actually hurt more, it sounds like, to end recommendations at this point? Point. Is that right? I think when people, there are many use cases, so for example, I'm watching how to do something and there are nine videos and the recommendation system is what tells me which is the next video to watch and you know, related to what I'm doing. So there are many uh, you know, positive use cases but we I see. I mean because of this really troubling one. Which is why we are you know, really making changes to how it works. Our recommendations is not based on uh, you know, getting you to just watch more videos. It's based on the fact that we are optimizing it for higher quality videos as well. You sent a letter this week to all Google employees um, specifically about how the LGBTQ community is feeling right now. And you wrote, the LGBTQ plus community has felt a lot of pain and frustration over recent events. What is your message to them right now from, from Google management? You know, facing harassment online, uh, just based on your identity, uh, you know, or your sexual orientation, uh, you know, is you know, is just extraordinarily wrong, and you know, to have it happen on a continual basis. So we feel our responsibility as a platform. Uh, but you know, when when we run into these things, we have to step back, think about how we can evolve in a, our policies in a way that doesn't catch a lot of uh, innocent content that shouldn't, you know, that don't fall in these areas. You know, today people it could be a edgy comedy show on TV or. You know, so free speech is something which we need to think about where you know, we have to have thoughtful policies on how we you know, put restrictions around it. And so that's the debate we have. But I want to acknowledge the pain that community felt through, through moments like that. But we are hard at work to make it better. Because, and you're specifically referring to YouTube in these policy changes, um, at this point has not taken down these videos containing homophobic and racist slurs, for example, against a, a journalist at Vox. Um, I know you've demonetized them, and you're talking about how you're going to handle them. What are the chances that you remove those videos? Just like, you know, we are going to undertake, uh, you know, look at our harassment policies. And when we do this, we do it very consultatively. We engage with many external groups. We don't think we always have the best perspective on these things. And as part of that, you know, we arrive at the next set of policies and, you know, and, we, and, you know, we'll holistically take a look at it. And context matters, you know, how, you know, how something is getting used, how systematically it's done. And so we take the whole context into account and we have to make difficult decisions at times. Is this the hardest thing you've had to grapple with as CEO, sort of deciding what is what speech is okay and what's not? It is definitely one of the hardest things and, you know, in some ways, you know, companies alone aren't fully equipped to handle problems like that because you're, you know, and, and so I think there, there, is, there is a lot of work ahead. And so I think these conversations are important, but, you know, all of us are figuring out how to do it better. Let's talk about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. You have called AI potentially more profound than electricity or fire for humankind. Really? I think so. Uh, you know, I think it's one of the most profound technologies we are working on as humanity. Um, you know, I mean, fire and electricity are uh, really good. I you know, like the lights on and the heat in my house. And that's right. And we just saw our data centers working yes. here. Uh, and, and so these are extraordinarily important innovations. And, you know, but they had uh, downsides as well. And, you know, we've had to work through those uh, downsides. AI ends up being the same. You know, AI is more profound because it will apply to everything you do. I think it will increase human knowledge. It will increase human productivity and, you know, and, you know, will lead to many positive outcomes. You know, early detection of cancer is an obvious example to think through and, you know, being able to assist teachers in better with better educational tools is a great example. So there are many positive things which will come out of it. You have also said it's fair to be wary mm -hmm. about AI. And Elon Musk mm -hmm. has said that AI could prove to be, quote, far more dangerous than nukes. 
Is he right? I think, you know, by, by definition, if you think it's one of the uh, you know, it's most profound technologies we are working on, you know, everything has two sides to it. And, and so I think we have to be very cautious and very deliberate about how we solve for AI safety. And so, you know, I think Elon is right to be concerned about it. I'd like to talk a little bit about facial recognition because Google has chosen, at least for now, and this is interesting and important, not to sell. Uh, facial recognition technologies over concern, in your own words, about abuse and harmful outcomes. Um, we know that the tech is early stage, that it can show a bias against women and minorities. Talk to me about how you made that decision while your competitors like Amazon are moving full steam ahead. Like, Why do you, Sundar, was that the right move? You know, when we when we set out to step back and think through our AI principles and, you know, we realized there are potential cases in which there isn't a clear regulatory framework around how technology can be used. And that you know, gives us pause and goes back to the earlier conversation. You know, we don't want to do something and then find a few years later it was potentially misused in a very, uh, very bad way. So it gives us pause and uh, you know, I, I think it's a path we have chosen. We wanted to put it out so there's a conversation around the use of facial recognition. There are good use cases for facial recognition, and so, you know, I, but, you know, it's important. For example, we have used it to look at, you know, maybe movies that are getting made and to see the role of, you know, are women represented equally in movies? So you can, you can apply AI in very beneficial ways. But, you know, this is an area where I think it's fraught with potential for misuse and bias, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. So we just want to be a bit more deliberate about it. Kara Swisher has written about Silicon Valley and this idea of chief ethics officers. What do you think? Do you think that big tech, Google, should have chief ethics officers to grapple with all of these things that we're talking about? You know, I view it's the job of the CEO to be the chief ethics officer, uh, you know, for given the scale at which technology impacts society. So I, I view it as a fundamental part of my role. Uh, but I think ethics needs to come at all layers of the organizations, and you know, uh, you know, people are developing uh, work, you know, engineers and the marketers working on it, and so, you know, I'd rather write our ethical principles, mm -hmm. hold ourselves accountable to it, and and consult both internally and externally to get feedback on how we make progress. So one ethical decision that you have to grapple with every day, every big tech executive does, is privacy. Mm -hmm. um, Tim Cook recently said privacy in itself has become a crisis. Do you agree? Uh, I, I think it's very, very, you know, given the scale at which information is flowing, uh, I don't think users have a good sense for how their data is being used. And so I think we've put the burden on users uh, to a large extent. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need better frameworks where users get that comfort that they, that they are in control of their data, how it's used, and they feel like they have agency over it. And so I, I think it's an important moment for all of us to do better here. That's really interesting because you say, you know, we, we as big tech have put the burden on users and we need to change that. And I'm interested in sort of how you balance that, right? As you grapple with that, how do you also balance that with the fact that so much of Google's business and what drives the profit relies on having more and more data about the user, right? Advertisements, AI, what do you think? Most of the data we, we need is actually just to provide better services to our users. Uh, you know, the data we need for advertising is actually uh, really small. You know, when you type digital cameras into Google, you know, when we show advertisements, we know you're looking for digital cameras and, you know, that is, you know, most of the data we need. For advertising, there is little value in holding data for long periods of time because you're buying interest, uh, you know, just constantly evolve and so, the most of the data we you know, uh, use is on behalf of our users to give them information back. But we want it to be their choice. Different people want different uh, ways, and so we are working hard to make it easier for users. And, and you don't think that will fundamentally harm Google's business? Uh, I've never felt, uh, you know, our business is not dependent on, uh, you know, having lots of data on people. Uh, that, you know, it's, I think it's a misconception. You do? Yes. You recently wrote an op-ed and you wrote, privacy cannot be a luxury good offered only to people who can afford to buy premium products and services. Were you talking about Apple? Uh, I included even subscription services. We today, for example, we offer YouTube as a subscription service. It doesn't have ads. If you, 
uh, choose to use it, but we don't want to save our privacy protections only for that. Uh, most people around the world will be, you know, will need to use some services for free, and it's important privacy works in those situations as well. And you know, we, you know, we don't use data from your emails or your photos for advertising. We, you know, we use you, we store your photos so that we can give it back to you when you need it and that you have peace of mind around your photos. All right, let's talk about China. Is Google currently considering reopening search in China? Uh, we have no plans to uh, relaunch search in China. You were thinking about it. You did do work inside of Google to map out what restarting search in China would look like. Um, are those conversations going on at all now, or is there a 0% chance that, that Google will restart search in China in the, ne in the near term? There are, there are no plans for us to uh, consider relaunching our search uh, service in China. You know, we've always looked at, you know, we think about serving the next billion users. So as a company, you know, we, you know our mission compels us to provide information. So we, we evaluate that, you know, but, you know, we would need the right conditions to exist. And so, you know, we would do it on a set of principles that matter to us. And, and you mentioned conditions. And look at the, the reason Google pulled out of China in 2010 was the hack and the human rights violations that were found as a result. But, but I asked because in 2016 you said, I've always thought Google was for everyone, and that applies to China too. And you talked about serving Chinese users. Um, has something shifted in you, your calculation on your willingness to even explore search in China? Is it the fact that you have, you know, according to the State Department, two million ethnic mi Muslim ethnic minorities held in camps in China, the Hong Kong protests going on? Is it, has that shifted fundamentally your view? You know, I mean, there are often, you know, competing values. You know, we've talked about y y your content responsibility on YouTube, et yeah, cetera. Yeah. So, you know, we see the benefits we get when we provide information to users. Uh, but we don't want information presented in a wrong way to our users as well. And so these are issues we grapple with, you know, across the world, uh, to be honest. You know, the, the, we comply with laws and regulations. And so, you know, it's always a set of continued conversations we have at Google. But when you say conditions, it sounds like you're talking about the human rights issues in China, right? You know, for us, uh, you know, our ability to present our results in a way that, you know, users can see as the, as the right, without, right result. Without censorship. Without censorship. It's, a, it's an important condition. So is any level of censorship okay with Google if there were search in China? Or are you saying it would have to be uncensored by the government? You know, I don't want to speculate on a hypothetical situation. We have no plans, and you know, we are not spending time on it. Uh, time on it today. A few months ago, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Chairman uh, General Joseph Dunford, testified before Congress, and he said that the work that Google is doing in China, quote, is a direct benefit to the Chinese military. What did you think when you heard that, and what, what's your response? You know, I, I, mean, I think we, we took the chance to clarify. I, you know, we are not doing any work in China. We have a limited presence in China, and uh, the limited AI work we do in China, which we are transparent about, uh, is our open source project, TensorFlow, as well as we do some nonprofit work uh, in China. So uh, I think we have had good conversations around that and uh, cleared up any misunderstandings. I do think that um, it's important for people to know the decisions that, that Google has made in terms of, you know, what it's willing to do with AI and the Defense Department, for example, when you look at, at Project Maven and, and ending that, or pulling your initial bid ten, for the $10 billion DOD contract um, because of ethical concerns. Can you, can you walk me through how much your employees influenced that decision? You know, we are, uh, you know, we've been concerned about how we thoughtfully develop AI, and, you know, I think AI is powerful, and we are committed to, uh, you know, partnering with U.S. government, uh, you know, consistent with our AI principles. We think there are many areas, including cybersecurity, search and rescue missions, uh, you know, veterans health. There are many ways by which we think we can apply AI in a way that's beneficial. We've had some concerns about uh, weaponization, and, you know, and so we have drawn some lines, but we've been transparent about it, and, but we are committed to constructively working to help the country where we can. There were some employees that 
felt that working with the Defense Department, for example, was profiting off, off you know, war and potentially making drone strikes more lethal. Um, and some of them wrote to you and they, and they spoke up. Um, Jeff Bezos, Amazon CEO, recently said, if big tech companies are going to turn their back on the DOD, this country is going to be in trouble. Where do you two differ on this? You know, I actually, I mean, we are, there are many ways we work and collaborate, uh, you know, with the U.S. government. Uh, we care about our national security as well. We wouldn't be able to do what we do as a company if we didn't enjoy the freedoms, uh, you know, that, that we get and cherish. Uh, so I think, you know, on a practical basis, I think we'll be doing a lot of work. And, uh, you know, so I think, uh, you know, there's not much, uh, much of a difference. We are concerned there are senior AI researchers who are working on these technologies, no different from people who are working on genetics, who are concerned about the lines and where you want to do your work. And, you know, we respect their views. And, you know, so we are being very thoughtful and, you know, we'll be public about what we do and what we don't. Another um, decision that Google made that intrigued me is that, that you guys made the decision to stop allowing Google Assistant, which is what's used in Google Home if people have that in their houses, um, to, to record as the default. So you change the default mode to not record after it hears the prompt, hey Google. Amazon's Alexa, the default still is to, to record for AI purposes, making the machine learning more intelligent, et cetera, but that, that's a big difference. Why did you make the change? In general, you know, we are looking at how to simplify and make it easier for, uh, for us to minimize the data we have. And we are looking at everything we do. You know, just recently at Google I.O., you know, we offered auto-delete controls. So you can tell Google after three months or 18 months, you can just you know, automatically have your data be deleted. So we are constantly looking how to minimize data while we can provide the experience but we But you can. would have gotten more data, more rapidly and made the machine smarter if you had just stuck with record as the default. But did you think there was an ethical issue with that? Is that why you changed it? Uh, you know, we wanted it to be uh, user choice in general. And, you know, I think there are many users who, you know, they want sometimes a record of what they are doing because it has value to them. And so, you, you know, privacy is inherently very personal. And, you know, the, you know, you know depending on your life situation, where you are, the context in which you're using our products, whether it's in your home or not, you know, people expect have different privacy expectations. And so we are trying to match that, make it simpler. And I think we have more work to do, but you're going to see us do more and more there. Amazon, threat or opportunity? Uh, you know, both. Or Google? Uh, both. You know, today, many people use Google. And, and they buy products of Amazon. So we, we you know, partner with them on many, many places. There are areas we compete with them. And I think it's good. You know, there, there is actually a lot of competition amongst the big companies too. And, you know, and so it, you know, that's what gives rise to more innovation. And I think ultimately consumers benefit. Let's talk a little bit about women specifically mm -hmm. and, and diversity. So if you looking at the latest numbers, women make up 33% of Google's global workforce, 26% of leadership positions. Assuming you want to get that to 50-50, I know there's been a lot of work on this front. What's, what is the number one thing you think Google can do to get that to truly equal? I think it comes to ensuring that you know, women have uh, a, a very inclusive and uh, you know, the, the right experience when they are at work. You know. Uh, you know, we are growing fast, so numbers make it hard to actually find the talent pool at the rate at which we are growing, but we are very, very committed to that, and this is why we are transparent about, you know, we were one of the first companies to be very transparent about uh, the numbers and, and share it outside. And then, you know, it's about investing in them, uh, you know, in their career development and supporting their uh, work experience all the way through. Uh, you know, it's, it's a big part of the answer, I think. The Labor Department is taking a look at, at whether Google has underpaid women. And you guys recently did an internal study to that. And YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki told me a few years ago that she actually personally goes through the salaries at YouTube every so often to make sure that there is not that pay discrepancy. Do you, would you be supportive, Sundar, of, of legislation requiring big companies like you guys to publicly disclose 
pay for men and women in similar roles? Would that, would that help? I mean, if, uh, you know, we are happy to have uh, transparency with the right structure. Uh, you know, you have to look at the data carefully because there are different levels, different geographic regions. This is an area where we invest so many resources to make sure we get it right. And, and you know, it's one of the most rigorous statistical analysis we do with the uh, right scrutiny at all levels of the company. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we are very confident uh, that, you know, we, we have pay equity within Google. Uh, but, you know, but it's also about not just pay for a given level for uh, both genders, but it's about ensuring that, you know, women are able to progress through the organization because, you know, how you, how you get rated, how you're evaluated, how you're promoted, all of that sure. ends up contributing. And where you start, right? That's right, where you start. So one of the big, most public decisions you have had to make so far as CEO is firing a Google engineer who in 2017 wrote an internal memo arguing that women, because of our biology, are just not as good at tech. And that having women in these roles made Google less competitive, argued the gender pay gap was a myth. You fired him, he's suing. I'm interested, we're now in 2019. What did you learn from that? You know, for me it was important as a company, you know, you just mentioned we are already struggling to make sure uh, women have a truly inclusive experience, mm -hmm. getting the representation and making sure they can progress at all levels of the company. I do think they face headwinds today, uh, particularly in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. So I felt uh, 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 increased sense of burden around making sure we create the right environment around all of that. So, so speaking about that, I know that you um, think a lot about the employee situation after the walkout. Last year, about 20,000 Google employees in about 50 cities walked out to make a point on a number of issues, but largely on the handling of some sexual harassment situations and at, at the company. This is following Andy Rubin leaving with a $90 million payout and Google not talking about that publicly after sexual misconduct that he denies. Um, you told the New York Times last year, we're taking steps to do better. Can you talk to me a little bit about what has changed since the walkout? You know, we had initiated uh, you know, many changes even leading up to that moment, but we took that moment as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, clearly acknowledging that we need to do a lot more. We heard from a lot of people, mm -hmm. women and men, about how things can be done better. One of the most important decisions, decisions I made was uh, ending uh, the requirement for forced arbitration. Right. Uh, and to be clear, you know, you know, even through arbitration, we didn't have confidentiality provisions, but we ultimately decided it's better for employees to have that choice. And so that was one of the uh, bigger decisions we made. D did the walkout make Google a better company? Uh, I, I think so. You know, I think our employees clearly spoke up at a moment when the company hadn't gotten it right. And, you know, and I think, you know, there were many people across the company who participated in support of that. And I think, I think it's a good part of our culture that we were able to acknowledge something publicly and then work hard to get things better. Two of the organizers behind the walkout have publicly said that these women, Meredith and Claire, felt backlash for their role. One of them just left, Claire, and, and she, she, she wrote about you know, what she felt and, and why she felt like she couldn't stay. She talked about the head of her department branding her with a scarlet letter. Uh, does that concern you? And, and is that being investigated? Like, are, are you worried that some, even though you say it makes the company better, are you at all worried that individually from their management, some people are f saying they're feeling backlash? I mean, when you run a company at scale, you know, it's extremely important to me that there's no retaliation at the company. I take it very seriously. You know, we have uh, very rigorous processes with, you know, multiple levels of oversight on something like that, uh, which is important. You know, I can't comment on individual cases, but, you know, it's something we take very seriously and we want to be, uh, you know, a leading company in terms of how people experience Google. All right, I'd like to talk about the election and election security, because this is so important to Google. You talked a lot about it in your congressional testimony and your commitment to it as a company for, for the sake of, of, of the democracy. Um, what do you see as the biggest risk to security for the 2020 election? Is it, is it these deep fake videos? I mean, there's an area we've invested a lot. You know, I think it's worth acknowledging, you know, be it the 2018 midterm elections or we just had one of the largest democratic processes, elections in India over 
a month and a half, uh, and you know, and we think we all the effort we put into it, uh, you know, have paid uh, dividends. So it's something we have to be very vigilant. Uh, you know, there there could be new ways in which uh, misinformation gets disseminated. Uh, we are worried about both shallow fakes and deep fakes, and. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have deep fakes. You know, you can manipulate videos in many ways, and but so it's something we're very concerned about. I mean, how worried should people be when when it took this company a day last week to make a video, a, a deep fake video of Mark Zuckerberg that looks and sounds like him, and it took them a day? Um, and you've seen it done with the president and with, you know, candidates. I mean, how, like, does America need to wake up to this? You met with the president uh, recently, and he has said multiple times that Google News searches are rigged, um, that they're against conservatives. Were you able to change his, his mind? Did you guys talk about that? Uh, you know, we, we had a productive uh, conversation. I understand the concerns. You know, there's a lot at stake uh, uh, politically across both sides, and we have had concerns in various ways ex expressed across both sides. We are very committed. This is what we do as a company. You know, we provide accurate and trusted and relevant information. We do this based on what our users tell us. We evaluate it using search raters mm -hmm. uh, representatively across the United States and globally. So you know, I had a good conversation uh, both with the president and others when I meet, explaining how we do our work and our commitment to approach our work in a nonpartisan way. All right, as we wrap up, just a few big picture questions. Um, Let's talk about making the world better. You told the New York Times there's no better time to be alive. Um, has technology made our world a, a better place, a safer place, a smarter place? Uh, you know, it does. I mean, progress is tough to see, but you know, anyway, when you step back and take a long-term view, we are clearly making progress, but the stakes have gotten higher too. What is the most important lesson you've learned running Google? You know, it's what you think internally alone is not enough, and you have to hear perspectives from, from the outside, uh, you know, and you have to be open to uh, what's going on around you, uh, understand the impact of your products, and, and learn and work hard to make that better. So I ask almost everyone I interview this, because I think about it a lot as a parent, I suppose, uh, when it comes to success in the end. What do you want your children to say about you one day? You know, two things that, you know, that dad loved what, uh, what he did, approached uh, his work with a passion, and uh, I think had a genuine care and concern uh, for how the work impacted people around him. Sundar, I, I so appreciate your time, and I wish you guys luck. Thank, Thank you. you very much.